welcome. First of all, welcome. This is Unsolicited Perspectives. I'm Bruce Anthony, your host here to lead the conversation in important events and topics that are shaping today's society. Join the conversation by following us wherever you get your audio podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch our video podcast. Rate, review, like, comment, share. Share with your friends, share with your family, hell, even share with your enemies. On today's episode, I'm going to be dilly-dallying a little bit, talking about fandom. Then I'm going to be introducing Black Facts. Those are Black Facts for Black History Month. And then I'm going to tell the story about the time that my brother almost got me into a fight against two bullies. But that's enough of the intro. Let's get to the show. Fandom. It's an interesting thing. As we... Get ready to approach the Super Bowl. I know that whoever wins the Super Bowl, there will be a city that gets burned to the ground. Why? Because fans of the team that win decide to tear up the city. We've seen it happen in almost every Super Bowl that the winner tears down the city. And I know I'm being hyperbolic when I say tears down the city, but they get wild. And it brought me to something that was very interesting that happened this week. And I know. You guys are going to be like, professional wrestling again, Bruce? I'm not going to dive too much into professional wrestling. I just want to tell what happened this week. So The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, has come back to wrestling. He's now a board of directors for World Wrestling Entertainment, formerly known as uh, WWF, for those people who haven't been paying attention for the last 20 years. And um, he's coming back to WrestleMania. You know, I described it earlier as WrestleMania is wrestling Super Bowl and he's coming back and some of the fans weren't happy about it. What, what he did was kind of interject himself into the main event and, you know, wrestling is a male soap opera, right? It's scandal. It's dynasty. It's not landing. It's God and light for those people that go way back in, in the history. It's a soap opera. It's a male soap opera in which they fight each other at the end. And, I'm always a fan of it, but WWE World Wrestling Entertainment has been telling a story for two years leading up to these two individuals, Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes, that are going to enter into this one match. I mean, for Roman Reigns, it's been a four year long story build. Uh, So think how I met your mother. Some people were really agitated about the ending. I know I was. They had built it up over eight or nine seasons, and the ending, I felt, was a dud. So this is supposed to be the ending of this years-long story, and The Rock, supposedly during storyline terms, interjected himself into the main event, and the crowd was not too happy because they really want to see this one match, which is kind of surprising because The Rock is uber popular, and the fans turned on him. And it was, you know, it was surprising to see the fans turn on him because he's such a major superstar and a cultural influence. He's got his fingerprints in just about everything from him coming out, supporting Biden in the last election. I'm sure he'll come out and support one of the presidential candidates again. Maybe, maybe not. He's got a lot riding on him from being the, the highest grossing movie star over the last couple of years to blockbusters and 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 sellouts and 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 all types of stuff it, 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 his business interests and in professional re- not uh, professional football with the XFL and then the USFL and his merger and his business partner his former wife which by the way aside like that is so dope that two people could be married get divorced and still be business partners, co-parent, raise their daughter, who's also in professional wrestling. I'll get to that in a minute. And still still be like dope friends. And like I said, this is a side about divorce, because I have a lot of friends that are either gone through divorce or getting a divorce. You can be friends with your ex. I'm not friends with my ex, uh, but you can be friends with your ex. Things, depending on how things go, you know, you grow up, you grow apart, you know, some people in your life for a season and a reason, right? Like, and, and that applies to, to marriage as well. So that was a quick aside. It's really dope to see them as business partners all through these years. But like I said, now The Rock, Dwayne Johnson is a board of director for the WWE and interjected himself in his main event. And there was backlash from a lot of the fans. And this is the point where I talk about fandom. Fandom or being a fanatic is dangerous 
because not only did they tweet and leave comments on YouTube posting and Instagrams and Twitter postings on him saying they don't, the fans didn't want him in the match. They want the Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns in the match. The fans took a left turn. And like I said, his daughter is also now a developing professional wrestler in the in their quote unquote minor leagues or the development territory that still is associated with the WWE called NXT. She doesn't go by uh, her last name. She goes by a different name, but everybody knows that's, that's The Rock's daughter. And they go into her DMs and her Twitter page and her Instagram page and do death threats. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a fan of professional wrestling. And there have been a lot of times where they have done something that I'm just like, that's not the story that I want to see. Why are you not listening to us? That's not what we want to see. Uh, and and you get frustrated. And I get it because if you're a fan of something you want to see, like a television show or movie, you want to see it play out a certain way. You don't want to be disappointed at the end. Uh, I get that. But to threaten his daughter who, one, has no interest in what's going on. She's not connected to it anyway, aside from the fact that The Rock is her father. And to give her death threats like she has some type of control over any of the uh, production or writing of the storyline or anything like that is absolutely crazy. And this isn't the only example of athletes or entertainers, musicians, artists, or anything getting death threats from fans. I'm scared to death of what's going to come Taylor Swift's direction when the supposed situation happens where she's going to endorse Joe Biden. And if you've been paying attention to conservative media, they've been all on her because they know that she is more than likely, like the last election, going to support Joe Biden for re-election because she she has a following. Right. Like she her fans, the Swifties are intense and 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 she can she she's culturally extremely, extremely relevant to the larger scope of society because, you know, she can she has masses that follow her. And when she comes out and pretty much gives that endorsement to Joe Biden somehow, some way, um, they're predicting that it's going to happen sometime around this Super Bowl. I feel for her and the backlash that she's going to get. She's going to get death threats. Politicians get death threats all the time for bills that's being written because everything is so toxic. Fandom isn't just for entertainment. Fandom is politicians. Don't get don't get anything twisted. Donald Trump has fans. They're fanatics about him. See no wrong. Do no wrong. in Anything that he ever does. Uh, That blind type of. Aberration is Dangerous, extremely, extremely dangerous. But we've we've not only seen this in in politicians and entertainers. We've seen it for causes, right? There have been fans of the pro life or pro right movement, and uh, we know that there have been people that have attacked doctors from the pro life movement that have shot and killed doctors for the pro life mu- movement. Which is weird because you're pro life, but you will kill a doctor so that they don't perform abortions. Uh, the contradiction is is beyond me. The hip, the hop, the, pop, the hypocrisy is beyond me. But uh, you you do what you do, boo boo. I don't really get it in any way. But like I said, fandom fanaticism can be extremely, extremely dangerous. And for those people that are out there listening, there's nothing wrong with being passionate about something. Just make sure that your passion doesn't make you lose yourself. Don't lose yourself in that passion. And a lot of people do that. So for all the people that are going to be watching the Super Bowl, for all the people that, uh, Pay attention to professional wrestling for all the television shows that you love, like the Game of Thrones and and uh, Sopranos and The Wire, even though those shows have long since passed uh, for those musicians that you love for the for the actors and the movies and the Harry Potter and the Lord of the Ring fans that are out there, you know, that that love their that love their IP. That's intellectual property for those people that don't understand. IP is a major, major thing in, in content. Uh, content is television, movies, uh, music, 
IP, Harry Potter is an IP. Lord of the Rings is an IP. When you have uh, the spinoffs of that, I don't know what they are because I don't pay attention to those movies or shows. But when you have spinoffs of that, those are IP. Uh, there's a lot of artists, uh, movie producers, directors, writers who are getting agitated to that. They're there's no more original IP anymore that, that the only way there's no originality anymore. The only way that you can get things done is by doing IP. And actually, when you think about it, going back to my original point of the rock, the rock is an IP. He's a huge IP. You have Dwayne, the rock Johnson, who's going to come to your wrestling event and make it bigger than it already was. And make no mistake about it. They did a press conference, uh, a Thursday last week and The Rock was out there, Roman Reigns was out there, Cody Rhodes was out there, another wrestler, Seth Rollins was out there, a press conference for WrestleMania that had big numbers, that got a lot of eyeballs to the product. So much so, people that are not fans of wrestling, but know that I'm a fan of wrestling, have been calling me talking about, hey, The Rock is doing something with wrestling again. It's that big of a deal to get the, the casual fan is always going to is always going to be the, not the casual fan. The the fan fan is always going to be there, but the casual fan and the person who isn't a fan that's just a fan of Dwayne the Rock Johnson, their eyeballs are going to be turned to this because he's involved in something. That's IP, huge IP. But at the same time, just because your story or what you wish the outcome of the story that you've been paying attention to for years may not go the direction that you wanted to go, that doesn't mean that your fanaticism starts to become threatening to other people. Don't send death threats to his daughter. What are you thinking? That's the reason why people say wrestling fans are crazy. Cause, cause of stuff like that. Absolutely. At, I, I, you know, I'm at a loss for words when I read the article to the point where she had to turn off her Twitter, had to turn off her Instagram and he had to come out and say something. That's a bit ridiculous. But you know, back to fandom. WrestleMania is going to be pretty good. I'm excited for it. The Rock is back. If you haven't seen the press conference, go on YouTube, type in The Rock press conference WrestleMania. It was a, it, even if you don't like wrestling, the drama that was on that stage, hey, The Rock is not that bad of an actor. <laughs> that, that's all I can say. The Rock isn't that bad of an actor. But for all those people out there, are going to be watching the Super Bowl. Your team is going to lose. Your team is going to win. Maybe you don't have a dog in the race. Don't act crazy out there. Just enjoy the game and and enjoy the entertainment that's being presented to us from all different genres, whether it's television, whether it's movies, whether it's music. Just enjoy it. It doesn't have to be one way all the way to the right or one way all all the way to the left. You can absolutely just fall in the middle and enjoy the ride. Hey there, podcast listeners. It's Bruce Anthony here, and welcome to another episode of Unsolicited Perspectives. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's been on my mind lately, the importance of staying hydrated and taking care of ourselves. Whether it's prioritizing our health and wellness or gearing up for festival seasons or just gearing up for whatever season or time of year, there's one brand that's been my go-to for all things hydration, Liquid IV. Speaking of health and wellness, let's dive into how Liquid IV can fuel your well-being. Imagine starting your day off right, feeling refreshed and energized. Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier is the missing piece in your daily routine. With just one stick, you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone. It's perfect for those early mornings, pre-workout boosts, moments when you're just feeling run down, or even after a late night or long flights. I absolutely love how convenient Liquid IV is. The packaging makes it easy to bring with me wherever I go. And let me tell you, it's become vital daily part of my routine. The flavors, <laughs> let me tell you something, they're incredible. From refreshing sea berry and strawberry lemonade to classics like lemon lime and watermelon, there's a flavor for every preference. It's like a burst of hydration with a hint of deliciousness. Picture this. One stick of liquid IV mixed in 16 ounces of water, hydrating you two times faster and more efficient than water alone. And with 12 mouth water and flavors, you'll never get bored with your hydration routine. Plus, liquid IV is packed with five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and of course, vitamin C. It's also made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, 
free of gluten, dairy, and soy. This is hydration at its finest. But it doesn't stop there. Liquid IV believes that access to clean and abundant water is the foundation of a healthier world. That's why they partner with leading organizations finding innovative solutions to help communities protect both their water and their futures. It's incredible to know that Liquid IV has already donated over 39 million servings in 50 plus countries around the world. They truly walk the talk. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code unsolicited at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code unsolicited at liquidiv.com. Remember folks, taking care of ourselves should always be a priority. So why wait? Head over to liquidiv.com, pick your favorite flavors and experience hydration like never before. Stay refreshed, stay hydrated, and keep rocking those unsolicited perspectives. Now, you know what I love? I love potato chips. I really, really do. Now, I know I said at the top that we're going to do Black Facts for Black History Month, and this is a Black Fact for Black History Month. One, that I love potato chips. I mean, that's a black fact. I am black and that's a fact. I do love potato chips, all different types of potato chips. I really love kettle chips, right? And if you give me some kettle chips that are barbecue or some kettle chips that are sour cream and onion, uh, not sour cream and onion, cheddar and sour cream, oh, I'm in heaven. I'm in Nirvana. I'm singing Nirvana. I'm, sm I'm singing Smells Like Teen Spirit as I'm eating them chips. I'm on a chip cleanse right now because I'm trying to get my weight down. You know, I, I got on the scale the other day and and I'm not happy with what's on the scale. So y'all will see some changes, especially in my face as I start to lose weight because I, I don't like being a fatty. But one of the reasons why I am a fatty is because I love chips. I'll get a bag of chips and eat a bag a day. Like, honestly, I can't do that. But little to no, to my surprise, not little to my surprise, because nothing surprises me about us as black people. Oftentimes we come up with really, really great stuff. A lot of times we don't get credit for it. I found out that a black man created the potato chip. That's right. George Crumb. He was born uh, George Speck. He was born July 15th, 1824. He's a cancer, just like myself, in Saratoga Springs, New York. He was working at Moon's Lake House, a, a prestigious restaurant catering to wealthy Manhattan families. One day, a customer was complaining that his French fries was a little too thick. So he was annoyed that this customer kept complaining and sliced these super, super thin potato slices and fried them up, later becoming the potato chip. <laughs> so that's that's what he did. He basically did that to get even at this complaint. Now, anybody that's ever worked in the restaurant industry, you know, people be complaining, it's annoying. It'll get on your nerves. And George Crumb decided <laughs> that he was going to create this one thing that is what we now know as the potato chip, but he did it out of spite. And you know what? I ain't mad at him because I've done a lot of things out of spite. Spite is what generates a lot of my creativity and a lot of my drive. And George Crumb created a potato chip out of spite. Um, <laughs> so... so Everybody, what they found out is that he created this thing and people really started liking it and it took off. It's, it was a signature dish for this restaurant for years to come. Now, it wouldn't be a black history fact or black history if there wasn't some dispute about what this person accomplished. Because if you go throughout black American history at all, all the accomplishments that black people typically make, history tries to create an asterisk that goes along with it. So there's been some disputes that he actually created the potato chip. Some people say that there was actually uh, earlier recipes and cookbooks from the early 1800s already containing recipes for fry for frying thin potato slices. Crumb on his own obituary uh, didn't make any mention of the potato chips. Now, one reason why you might not make mention of a potato chip is if you're a chef. You don't want to be known as the person that created a snack. Like you would want to be known as somebody who created this culinary masterpiece. So I could understand why he would not want to put it on 
his tombstone or obituary that he created the potato chip. Hell, there's a lot of things that I've done that other people would say that's pretty cool that I don't want people to know I did it. <laughs> I'm just going to be real honest. And I know a lot of people listening and watching out there feel the same way. There's a lot of things that, that we have done that other people would look at as accomplishments. There is not a, that much of an accomplishment to us. And we just say, eh, it's OK. It's like putting on my obituary. I graduated high school. That's not an accomplishment. Not to me. It isn't. But for some people, it is absolutely an accomplishment for some people. For me, I would love to be the inventor of the potato chip. I would love to have that on my on my resume because I love potato chips. But George Crumb didn't want that. Uh, also, you know, siblings is a funny thing. So another dispute was his sister's claim Kate Wicks, who was his sister, asserted that she was the true inventor of the potato chip. According to her, she accidentally sliced off a silver of potato into a hot frying pan and Crumb loved the result. So even he, even his own family is trying to take credit away from him. And that's that's black on black crime. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that was just funny to me. That's black on black crime. But I would tell you that a lot of times my sister loves to take credit for stuff that I came up with. Now, she's going to say I'm throwing her under the bus again. And I am because there's a lot of times little sayings I used to have. I used to come up with little slang words back in the day and she would swear up and down. I came up with that. I'm like, no, you didn't. No, that that was my thing. No, you can't ever remember anything. I'm like, no, I absolutely remember me coming up with that. Nope, that was me. So I can understand siblings trying to take the credit, especially if it was a younger sister. I don't know if it was a younger sister or not, but uh, they try to discredit him. But despite the controversy, Crumb uh, su achieved success. He opens Crumb's he opened Crumbs, a popular restaurant in New York, and Sar Saratoga Chips, Moon Lake's house, became renowned for the special Saratoga Chips thanks to Crumbs culinary invention. So regardless of people trying to discredit his achievement, the achievement was real. He created the damn potato chip. I don't care what nobody say. Even if it was in cookbooks, it wasn't popular until then. He created the potato chip. And I want to thank George Crumb from the bottom of my heart for creating such a delicious snack. Maybe, quite honestly, the greatest snack because without the invention of the potato chip, we wouldn't have the Dorito. We wouldn't have the Cheeto. Would we even have pretzels? Think about all that stuff. And my favorite snack is a snack called Munchies. Now, I know you'll look at the name and say, hey, Bruce, you know, you know what that name signifies. Yes, I do. And if I partake in the devil's plant known as marijuana, I like to eat this bag of snacks. And it's a combination of a sun chip, a Dorito, a Cheeto and pretzel. Now, you tell me that's not absolute heaven. And you know what I will do when I'm trying to be super nasty is part of the reason why I need to cut this weight down. When I'm trying to be super nasty, I'll take the munchies and put this in this big bowl. I'll take the munchies and I'll get some trail mix and I'll mix them together. And just to put the creamer on top, I'll add some ruffles, ribbed cheddar and sour cream chips, and then swoosh them all around, sit down on my couch with a drink and watch whatever movie or sporting event, I'll pay for it the next morning because my stomach doesn't feel too good because you get older and you can't digest the things that you usually be able to digest, which is really another thing about getting older that sucks. Uh, that and plus trying to get this weight off. It used to be a time where I could eat a whole bag of potato chips and I would lose weight. Now I eat a whole bag of potato chips and I gain 27 pounds that very moment, 27 pounds. But you know what? I'm still thankful for George Crumb for creating such a delicious snack. Now, I wasn't going to just end the Black History, Black Facts segment with something that was kind of disputed and something that was very interesting, but more humorous than anything else. I had to get into something a little bit more serious that was a Black invention that I know a lot of people he out here that are listening and watching this show benefit from this and don't even know where it originated from. And you know what I'm getting ready to lead to next? The home security system. So Mary Vaughn Britton Brown 
was born in 1922 in Jamaica, Queens, New York. Now, Jamaica, Queens, New York, it's the home of a lot of people that are important. It's home of 50 Cent. <laughs> I don't know why I just said 50 Cent is important, but he is. He created power. And I love the power universe. Uh, 50 Cent, Jam Master J, God rest his soul. Uh, Supreme McGriff, the guy who shot 50 Cent. Also, Queens, not Jamaica Queens, but Queens in general, is the main setting for Coming to America, the greatest comedy movie of all time. So Jamaica Queens, stand up. One of my closest friends is from Queens, New York. Not Jamaica Queens, but Queens, New York. But anyway, uh, Marie Van Britton Brown uh, was a nurse. And while her husband, Albert Brown, Albert Brown was an electrician, electronics technician. So Marie faced safety challenges due to her irregular work hours and living in a high crime neighborhood. Yes, Jamaica, Queens has always been a little dangerous, right? I mean, 50 Shinga got shot nine times. He lived and got shot nine times. This is a lot of a lot of crime in Jamaica, Queens. And so she's coming home late because she's a nurse and irregular hours. And anybody that knows anybody that's a nurse, like my mom was a nurse, uh, Technically, I guess she's still a nurse, but she's not like a nurse that works in the hospital anymore. She used to. It's like weird hours. Nurses have weird hours. And you're coming home late at night. Working these weird hours can be a little dangerous. So what did she decide to do? She decided to create the closed circuit television, the CCTV system. Let me explain how she got there. Worried about her vulnerability about getting home, she decided to create a system that would allow her to see who was at her door. In 1966, with her husband, Albert's assistant, she invented a home security system that would change the landscape of safety technology. What she did was created four peepholes. The system included four strategically placed peepholes, uh, a motorized camera that could slide to capture images of people at different heights. The television monitors displaying a camera feed, allowing homeowners to see outside. Two-way microphones where Mary could communicate with visitors using the, uh, using the microphones. Remote control. She had a remote control to unlock the door from a safer, safer distance and an emergency button in, in, to alert police and security. She patented this in 1969 with her, uh, with her husband and... She's been recognized for her work in the New York Times, where she received the award for the National Scientist Committee. This led to the CCTV revolution, which, you know, is security, right, for everything that is being guarded, whether it's warehouses, office buildings, uh, prisons, libraries, because libraries need to be uh, protected because everybody trying to ban books and attack libraries. Schools, you know, these things, the CCTV system is, a, you know, a security system that was created by this black couple, black woman and black man, because they needed to protect her when she was coming home. And this all led to the revolutionary aspect of home security. Who doesn't have a rain camp? Everybody got a rain camp. And you know what the genesis of all this stuff was? Marie and her husband, Albert. Those are black facts. Who else out there knew about that? I didn't know about that. And I like to be knowledgeable about everything that's going on in the world. It's so many inventions. There's more. Don't worry. I'm going to introduce more. Not today in this episode, but as we go along, you know, throughout this month, which is Black History Month, I'm going to be introducing more black facts uh, on Black History Month. And you know what? No. Nah. Um, it's not going to just be about Black History Month. I'm going I'm going to do this periodically where I give black facts of things that people weren't know that isn't the common knowledge of the world and society and how black Americans have really, really, really impacted what it is daily lives. Now, I, I don't know that I forget the name of this guy, but the guy that created the ring camera the you know, he, he pitched it to that show with Mark Cuban and all those people where they pitch ideas and they turned them down. And eventually he became one of the people that uh, would be the investors. I forgot. Uh, Shark, Shark Tank. Shark Tank is a show. Great, fantastic idea. But like he didn't come up with it. <laughs> like the idea was already there. He's a billionaire. And but the idea was already there because Mary and her husband, Albert, came up with a way for Mary to come home and feel safe. And I mean, the intricacies of this in the 60s, mind you, the intricacies of this to create the multiple peepholes, the camera to take still shots, the two-way microphone, the, the 
button to lock from a distance, the emergency button to alert authorities. Like it really was the genesis of everything that we know of as security. And here it is, this beautiful black couple that nobody knows about. I mean, New York Times, you know, wrote something in the National Committee of Scientists, gave them an award, and that's that's beautiful. You know what I'm saying? And I, like, But I mean, I didn't know about this. And this was only a little bit over a decade before I was born. And it's not gotten talked about since then because nobody really knows about it. Nobody really knows that the reason why we feel safe at home is because Mary and Albert created a system in which she could feel safe at home, patented, and we don't recognize them like we should. She should be recognized. The, the inventor of, of Ring, the Ring camera, and don't get me wrong, he there's nothing wrong with taking an idea and taking it to the next level, but at least acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, you didn't come up with the original idea. And home security system has always kind of been a thing. I know you watch Scarface. Scarface had <laughs> had CCTV. Remember when he was in there w- w- with Manilo and uh, he was worried about the car that was sitting on, on, on the road for a couple of days. And he was like, he thought there was the Diaz brothers. They've come to get him. <laughs> so I was watching Griselda the other day. She had a security system. This is all, this is all after the sixties and all these drug dealers and not just drug dealers. I'm, I'm, I'm being once again hyperbolic, but just people in general, everybody out there listening, you have a home security system. Uh, I don't, uh, now that I think about it, have a home security system. Uh, my home security system used to be my dog, but he's gone. So I guess my home security system is me. And technically, I no, I got a whole lot of stuff that people would want to get. Maybe I should get a ring camera too. Maybe that's what I'll do this weekend now that I think about it. And I have Mary to think about it. I have Mary and George because you know what I want to do? I want to sit in the comfort of my own home secured by the inventions of Mary and eat the invention of Albert potato chips. Now, I can't have any more potato chips till April 1st. I swore on myself for this year that I wouldn't have any potato chips for the first three months of the year. So April 1st is the last is the next time I can have potato chips. So I can't really do this until April 1st. But damn it, on April 1st or April 2nd or 3rd, sometime around that period. I'm going to have my home security system. I'm going to be checking my rain camera and I'm going to be eating potato chips. And that's all to the great work of George Crumb and Mary Van Britton Brown. And don't forget Albert Brown, too. Don't forget Albert, because uh, Albert had a hand in this, too. But, you know, it was, it was Marie's idea. So we're going to give her, you know, the majority of the credit. And, and that is Black Facts for Black History Month. But we're going to continue going giving Black Facts Every time I come to see something that's really interesting. I tell you what, there's one thing that I can say is that I love my siblings. Would do almost anything for them. Almost. I ain't going to jail for them, but would do almost anything for them. And I know a lot of people have been wanting and asking and, and sending in requests to, to, you know, we had the sibling happy hour with my sister and they, they want to hear from my brother. He ain't, I don't think he's ever going to be on the show. I will tell you that he watches and listens to every episode. So thank you, brother. I really appreciate your support. Uh, I love my brother dearly. We are very different people, extremely different people. We are close. We're all close. All three of us are close. There's one thing that my brother has done through the years, and uh, that's get me into fights. One of the problems of being an older sibling is a lot of times you got to fight your younger siblings battles. And I was never a small kid. I was always a big kid. And there's a golf. There's an age golf between me and my brother five and a half years. So there's a lot of times where my brother would get himself into situations that I would have to get him out of. And like I said, I love my brother. But back in the day, he had a problem with running his mouth. Why? Because he knew that he would always have his big brother watching his back. I remember the very first time 
that I had to fight somebody because of something my little brother did. We were living in Columbia, Maryland. I was 11 years old in sixth grade. My brother, I believe, was in kindergarten, maybe in the first grade. And we lived in this neighborhood and there was a whole bunch of this is back in the day where there was a whole bunch of kids in the neighborhood. And we used to all be outside playing, playing the street. We'd play football, basketball, like uh, like anything. We were playing in the street. And this one lady down the street was the, the neighborhood babysitter. It was probably not legal, but like she was the one that would watch kids because uh, she was a stay at home mom. She was the one that would watch kids in the neighborhood uh, before and after school and during the summer when parents had to go to work. Um, Child care. Right. So she watched basically all the kids in the neighborhood that needed to be watched. And so my boy, my best friend at the time, that was his stepmother. Uh, they didn't really have a great relationship. But one of the kids that uh, she used to babysit did something to my brother. I don't know what he did. I can guarantee you that my brother started it. I, that's what I know. For, th there's one thing that I know for sure. These two stories I'm about to tell you, I know for a fact. Three stories. I'll tell you three stories. These three stories I'm about to tell you, I know for a fact. 100% fact. My brother started it. So I don't know what he did. I don't know what he said. I wasn't around. I think I was at home playing Lakers versus Celtics on Sega Genesis or uh, the Joe Montana football game on Sega Genesis. I was at home chilling or playing with my wrestling man. I was at home chilling. I come in. My, I hear my brother crying. I run and I'm like, bro, what's going on? Why are you crying? This kid had either grabbed his arm or done something. I go storming out the door because I don't get the whole story. The story to me is this kid who was like a fourth or fifth grader had grabbed this little kid's arm that's like in kindergarten or first grade. That's a problem that I have to deal with. This kid was not no big dude. You know what I'm saying? This kid was just a kid. I mean, like kid, kid, never sense the word. And I'm 5'2", 5'3", at the time, 11 years old, walking down the street like a Brahma bull charging at this kid. And, and I say to him, what did you do to my brother? What'd you do to my brother? What'd you do to my brother? And his answers weren't good enough for me. So I punched him in the eye. And when I punched this little kid in the eye, I realized, I had realized in a couple of fights, a couple of years beforehand that uh, I could fight, <laughs> like I, I could throw hands a little bit, but that it was starting to get a little dangerous. There'd been times I bloodied a couple of noses and things of that nature. Like I, I, I hurt a few kids because I was a big kid. I punched this kid in the eye immediately because he's nine, 10 years old. Uh, immediately, he yells out this yelp and he just starts hollering, screaming and crying, running home. I'm now barred from playing with all the kids that this lady babysits and she babysits all the kids in this neighborhood. So I, I really don't have no friends for a while, all because my brother I know my brother did something. And what made it so bad was, is I didn't want to fight this kid. This kid was not somebody that I should be fighting. I knew that I could hurt him. And he had a big swelled up eye. And he was uh, a kid of a single family home. I believe it was his dad. It was his dad or his mom. But he, was his, he only had one parent. And, you know, he was he was. He wasn't like the athlete, he, you know, he wasn't like he was more like a nerd. And I just felt really bad swelling this kid's eye. I wanted to apologize to him, but I couldn't because whatever he did to my brother was completely unacceptable. But I, once again, I'm going to reiterate, and I know my brother is listening. I know you started it. I know you absolutely started it. There was another time. This time, I'm, this time I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the story that's more important where he got me into a situation where I had to fight two bullies or was about to have to fight two bullies. So this is that situation with fighting the two bullies is before this story that I'm about to tell you now, but we're living in, we just moved from DC. So we're living in Maryland. I mean, we just moved from Lynchburg. So we're, so we're living in Maryland. We've moved up to the DC area. We live in this townhouse community. Um, so obviously there's a lot of people from this community that are kids that go to the high school, the middle school and things of that nature. So I'm 16 years old and it's snowing outside. I don't like cold weather. I don't like the snow. So when it's snowing outside, I'm staying my ass inside the house and playing video games. I'm just happy that we don't have to go to school. So it's snowing outside and my brother and my sister are outside playing. 
And my brother runs in and says, this kid threw a snowball at me. Now I know the kid. He's literally my next door neighbor, right? Uh, we're the same age. I, I ride the bus with him to school. He's actually funny. And little known fact, later on, he becomes one of my closest friends, one of my best friends, right? But he threw a snowball at my brother. Me, not hearing the story, run outside and confront this individual. And I say, you threw a snowball at my brother. I will drag your head across this street and, and demolish you. This is what Those aren't the exact words, but I said something to that effect. He says to me, yes, I threw a snowball at your brother, but he threw the snowball at me first. He threw multiple snowballs at me. I asked him to stop. He wouldn't stop. I threw a little snowball at him. Mind you, this is years of fighting my brother's fights or not even my brother's fights, fighting on behalf of my brother. And I kind of knew once, once my neighbor told me the story, I knew my brother had started this shit. And so I said, hey, man, just, okay, don't throw no more snowballs at my brother. Just come to me if my brother does something like that again. And so I go into the house. I'm like, bro, you got to stop this stuff, man. You're wrong. You keep putting me in these situations where I got to go fight. And one day you're going to get me into major, major trouble and it could cost me my life. So stop putting me in these situations. Now, that was a story. That was the last time that I almost fought for my brother. This next story is when I, I'm still mad at my brother for this one. So we're uh, high school. I'm in high school. I'm probably 15 years old and I'm a camp counselor at this youth basketball camp. So all the people that are in like elementary school, all the kids that are in elementary school. I'm a youth counselor. Other youth counselors are people that play on the current high school basketball team that I play on and the local high school rivals basketball team. One of the players that played on my basketball team was also a football player. How good of a football player was he? He went to a major division one school. He played in a national championship game. And in that national championship game, he scored two touchdowns. He wasn't a quarterback or wide receiver. So that'll let you know he's not a small person. I mean, he was short in stature, but not a strong person and as strong as an ox. Okay. And he's two years older than me. That's one person. The other person is the star player on the rival school basketball team and also known in the streets for knocking folks out. I'm not exaggerating. He is known in the streets for knocking folks out at 16, 17 years old, sometimes grown men. This dude can fight. I have never had a problem with any one of these guys. Never. Don't really want a problem with any one of these guys. I'm not no punk, but I'm not going to interject myself into a confrontation with these two guys if I don't have to. That's just stupid. Well, my brother is at the basketball camp and my brother is acting wild because like I said, my brother at that time really, really, really loved to front his mouth. And he's ball hogging and he's not passing and he's running his mouth and he's talking mad ish. He talked more ish than a little bit to any and everybody. And because I'm his big brother, he feels like he could talk ish to the camp counselors. And he's been continuously doing it all week. And I told him, hey, bro, stop running your mouth. Why don't you pass other people the ball? Because the camp counselors are coaching these kids and they're trying to tell him the same things. I don't remember what he said to them. I remember what he did to him. It may have just been the fact that it had been a week of culmination of him just being ill and they got tired of him. So I'm coaching the kids and I see off in the distance, they're about to grab my brother and throw him in a trash can because of something that he did or said. And he's out there screaming my name, Bruce, Bruce, come help me. I see it. I run across this court uh, in this huge gymnasium. I run up to them. I get into both of their faces. Mind you, once again, let me remind you that one of them went on to play for a major Division I university and scored two touchdowns in a national championship game. And the other one is known for literally knocking folks out in the street. Our age, grown men don't matter. They both can fight. 
So I charge up to them. I get in both of their faces. And I said, if y'all don't put my brother down right now, we're going to fight. And they said, you're not going to fight. Either one of us, much less both of us. I said, that's my brother. I love him. I will literally fight you guys to the death. Put my brother down unless y'all are really ready to die. And it's like, you ridiculous, man. Ain't nobody about to die. I'm letting you know. Even if I lose, I'm coming back after you. And I'm going to keep coming after you every single day until one of us is dead if y'all don't put my little brother down. Now, did I mean it? Yes, I absolutely meant that because nobody is going to harm my family. Even if he's wrong, nobody's going to harm my family. And I was serious. I was probably going to take that L on that ass whooping from both of them. I can't be too. I'm not sure I could beat one of them, much less both of them at the same time. But I was going to come back every single day until they were gone or I was gone. Now, okay, I'm being hyperbolic again. I wasn't going to literally fight to the death. This isn't gladiator, right? I would go fight to the death. But the point was, is that what I had to fight for is way more important than what they had to fight for. I'm fighting for protecting my blood. They're fighting for what? Somebody was annoying to them. And that was the point. And I was willing to do it. And thank God they, they, they backed off, put them down, and they respected the fact that no matter if my brother was wrong, that I was going to defend him to my dying breath. I still feel that way. If something happened to my, if somebody attacked my, attacked my brother, it, as I told the story about Allie and the night that, uh, you know, we, we helped her get home in the uh from the metro when it looks like that guy was going to do something shady he kind of lunged at my brother and i lost it <laughs> this is when i'm a grown man this is when i'm in my 30s i lost it and i blacked out and all i know is is that i lifted him up threw him picked him up carried him through a flight of stairs in the metro pushed him through some double doors it was on the middle of the street, punching him in his face. That's all I remember. I am going to defend my family to my dying breath, even if they're wrong. In that instance, my brother wasn't wrong. But when we were growing up, my brother has consistently put me in altercations that I didn't want to be in altercations with. And guess what? I wasn't the baddest dude out there in the streets. I could fight a little bit. I could fight a little bit. I won some. I even lost some, right? I've won more than I lost, but I've lost some fights out there. And I would say there's been a lot of times where I've had to defend my brother or get in somebody's face or, or be confrontational to somebody because of my brother. And I wouldn't change it for the world. And I would do it all over again. And, and he changed as we got old. I told him that last time with the neighbor, I was like, you're going to put me in a situation where things can get deadly because we're at an age now where, and it was a time period in the 90s where people were shooting. And I was like, you're going to put me in a situation that's going to be deadly and you're not going to want to live with that. So stop. Just stop. You ain't got to run your mouth. You can keep it quiet. Your brother is not this. Your brother ain't The Rock. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I'm not that. I'm just an average smo that loves potato chips and might need to get a home security system. Thanks to Marie uh, Van Britton Brown and Albert Brown and George Cromwell for, for these great inventions that I love. And for my brother, <laughs> I love you, bro. Like, I know you're listening and watching. I love you. But you know, you know, for a fact, you, you put me in some situations that were not cool. And uh, I almost paid dearly for those situations. But regardless, wouldn't change it our, our relationship. Well, you know, be closer. But I wouldn't change the way we grew up for the world. I, I love my siblings and will do anything for my siblings. Freedom. So... That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you you learned a little bit, you know, black facts from black history. Uh, pay attention to your fandom. Make sure it doesn't turn into fanaticism. Make sure it doesn't make you come out of yourself for just celebrating something that you enjoy. Uh, make sure that you love your family the best you can in the best way that you can. And you always defend what's right. Even if sometimes it's wrong, <laughs> you defend what's right, even if it's sometimes wrong. I hope those are the lessons that you took away from today. But like always, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And until next time, as always, I'll holla. Whew. That was a hell of a show. 
Thank you for rocking with us here on Unsolicited Perspectives with Bruce Anthony. Now, before you go, don't forget to follow, subscribe, like, comment, and share our podcast wherever you're listening or watching it to it. Pass it along to your friends. If you enjoy it, that means the people that you rock will enjoy it also. So share the wealth, share the knowledge, share the noise. And for all those people that say, well, I don't have a YouTube. If you have a Gmail account, you have a YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can actually watch our video podcast. But the real party is on our Patreon page. After Hours Uncensored and Talk is Straight-ish. After Hours Uncensored is another show with my sister. And once again, the key word there is Uncensored. Those are exclusively on our Patreon page. Jump onto our website at unsolicitedperspective.com for all things us. That's where you can get all of our audio, video, our blog blogs and even buy our merch and if you're really feeling genuine and want to help us out you can donate on our donations page donations go strictly to improving our software and hardware so we can keep giving you guys good content that you can clearly listen to and that you can clearly see so any donation would be appreciative most importantly i want to say thank you thank you thank you for listening and watching and supporting us and i'll catch you next time Audi 5000. Peace.